everyone, this is Tawana J, and I'm your host of Shoot One Shot TV. And today we have Celeste Beattie on the show with us, and she is the first female Black woman brewery owner in the U.S. And she's going to be talking to us a little bit today about her journey and her experience as doing such. Hi, Celeste. Hi, how are you? Thank, thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So Celeste, let's just get right into it. How did you get into the beer brewing industry as a woman, uh, one of the most male dominated industries? Well, like many uh, people that love great beer, I started home brewing. I started home brewing in my apartment in Harlem in the 90s and fell in love with it. I uh, really didn't do it to start a company necessarily as I did just to learn more about uh, making beer. And I love cooking with beer and wine. And I learned that uh, Jimmy Carter, under President Jimmy Carter, a uh, law was passed allowing people to make small batches of beer and wine at home and got a brewing kit as a gift and started playing around with the ingredients. And two weeks later, it was beer. And I didn't turn back uh, from that point and just kept experimenting. Wow, wow, wow. And you also have like a background, right? You, in terms of, you know, how you grew up, you kind of were, um, you had some experience in growing up with, um, with Boo and Bear, is that correct? Well, I would say my experience growing up is one that we all have and brewing is cooking. You know, you can use your grandmother's five or 10 gallon uh, pot and uh, add water and, and, and barley and other spices, depending on the recipe. The same process, uh, those first few steps uh, are the same as making beer. So I think uh, we all have that background and we all have that history uh, in terms of uh, our culture of the origins of beer uh, from uh, the continent of Africa. Uh, lots of people still brew traditional beers there. And so I would say we all have that in our DNA. Um, it's, it is uh, very much connected to cooking and a big part of my inspiration for trying to uh, make my first batches was my experience growing up, uh, being with my grandmother, my aunts, my mom, making a big family soup. So I'm able to use that same pot as I did years ago to make beer. Wow. You, you use the same pot. That's, that's awesome. That's amazing. Would, yeah. would you say that, what was, what was it particular about, starting this in Harlem, though? Well, I happened to be in Harlem. I moved to Harlem uh, about 27 years ago. And the reason why I moved there is because I was so inspired by its history, um, the Great Migration. Uh, there were several migrations uh, to Harlem from the South. And my family, uh, many of them moved uh, to New York City, including Harlem and Queens and the Bronx, uh, to escape the persecution, as I would call it from the civil rights movement. They wanted to get out of the South. It was a very bad experience being there, as many of us know. And they decided to come North where there was still discrimination in the North, but it wasn't as harsh as uh, they experienced in the South. So we would travel to New York City and Harlem was always the place we would stop to see our family, connect with our cousins and to connect with uh, the culture of Harlem, the Apollo Theater, 125th Street, um, Abyssinian Church, Teresa Hotel, all those iconic places, the Studio Museum in Harlem, those are places that were like at the epicenter of our upbringing. We needed to go to these places, you know, in New York City, Chicago, and other cities that we pile up in the family station wagon and go on road trips. And uh, Harlem and New York City was one of the places we would visit. And it was a really enriching experience learning about the history and culture. So as a brewer, or as a designer, or whatever your passion might be, when you're in Harlem, you get all this inspiration. And as a brewer, I was inspired to a great deal uh, to infuse that history and highlight and celebrate that history in our beers. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's important that we're able to celebrate that history. Um, I know that, you know, I met you at a time, I guess they were calling it kind of like the second renaissance of Harlem. Um, and there was so much stuff going on, so many new businesses arising and, and different things. And it almost seemed magical at times to me in terms of like being able to connect with different people and the different things going on. Just in general, throughout your journey, what were some of the, I would say, like things that came up or people that showed up that was kind of like, you know, wow, like maybe unexpected as you were going on the journey? <laughs> A lot. 
Mm-hmm. Oh man. Uh, well, one, as I mentioned, just in terms of our history, certainly being able to immerse myself in a history where so many people have walked on 125th Street, you know, Billy Holiday, um, Duke Ellington, Scott Joplin, um, Sarah Vaughn, uh, civil rights uh, people, Martin Luther King. Um, there was just so much rich history uh, there. Uh, those people had already gone uh, before me. We had a, a very clear path on some of the many things we could uh, reflect on and be inspired by. And then um, I, I just met so many different people, um, local people, local entrepreneurs, uh, people that were engaged in, in various businesses. Uh, Rich Dennis, who now uh, created Shea Moisture, he owned a coffee shop and a uh, shop for his uh, uh, various soaps and, and other body care products. I got a chance to meet him and get to know him. Uh, we eventually um, were involved with the Clinton Foundation um, Entrepreneur Program. Uh, he was someone that I got a chance to, to watch him from his work selling his Shea uh, Butters on 125th Street. And uh, we stayed in touch uh, since he's gone on to create this incredible brand, uh, incredible company, Shea Moisture, Sundial. Um, Who else? Uh, There was a gentleman by the name of Joe Holland who founded the first Ben & Jerry's partner shop that was at the corner of 125th Street, 5th Avenue. I was involved with that project. Um, The body shop came later. I got a chance to meet Dr. Barbara Antier, who founded the National Black Theater who owns that building. Uh, she's since uh, gone on to be with our ancestors, but she, um, her family now still owns the building at 125th and 5th, which is the National Black Theater. Um, I got a chance to meet Percy Sutton, you know, the founder of the um, Apollo Theater. They took over the Apollo Theater many years ago and went on to, to found uh, a number of radio stations, WBLS and others, uh, Charles Wrangell, um, just a lot of uh, amazing people that I had a chance to not only meet, but they advised me. They gave me a lot of insights and, and inspirations uh, for how I should uh, build my company. Uh, Reverend Calvin Butts, um, Lloyd Williams, uh, so many people uh, that are really involved with Harlem today or were involved with various initiatives. Uh, Harlem Week, uh, these are all uh, amazing projects and and initiatives and movements, cultural movements that were a big part of, of my growth as an entrepreneur. Wow, wow. This, that, that's a mouthful of a whole bunch of various different interactions and people. And I know like um, it was very helpful to you on a journey. As you were, you know, building your company and, and, and doing all that you needed to do, what were some of the challenges that came up for you? Like a, particularly as a woman being in this industry? Well, one of the biggest challenges I had was the fact that I am a woman, and uh, this is a very male-dominated industry, uh, mostly white male-dominated industry. Um, It has become a lot more diverse over the years, but it's still primarily not a very diverse industry. Um, So that, uh, that was a challenge just in terms of getting people to take me seriously going into retail places and having to tell me that they didn't have room for my beer, that my beer was not something they wanted to carry, you know, distinguishing it as something odd or weird or just not of quality. Being told that a brand like Harlem couldn't succeed, that nobody would want to buy a product with the name Harlem on it because Harlem was dangerous. It was not a good place. I mean, that's changed dramatically. But when I first got involved with this industry, a lot of people did not want to put our beers on the shelf. Um, our first beer was Harlem Sugar Hill L. After that, we launched Harlem uh, Renaissance Wit and then Harlem 125th Street IPA. We also launched a cider, strawberry cider. All these products um, that we took into the market that we walk into bars and restaurants to drop off samples or have a sample, they were um, to a large extent not very receptive because they saw the name Harlem uh, brewing company on the product. So that was a challenge. Uh, then the fact that I'm a woman, um, many of these people in the industry, uh, in, in the bar and restaurant side of it, just 
didn't really see a lot of women selling beer and oftentimes thought that I was there to promote the beer or to dress up in a cute little mini skirt and do a wet t-shirt contest or something. <laughs> Just not really taking me seriously as someone who could speak about beer, could love and be passionate about being in this industry. Uh, those are things that I uh, encountered. And then race, race was a factor, uh, although they didn't say it. Um, it was it was pretty clear in some instances that there was just a problem with them getting over the fact that I had brown skin that I was uh, interested in talking about beer and that I was interested in talking about craft beer that it wasn't uh, Coke 45 or malt liquor or you know some other uh, uh, beer that we see in uh, many of our communities uh, they just have taken the persp the perspective that we couldn't possibly appreciate craft beer nor less drink it so uh, that's been a continual hurdle in a lot of ways but it has gotten better better as more and more craft breweries have opened and many of them have been uh, a little bit more open-minded about uh, people of color um, from the diaspora being able to appreciate uh, good beer so let's get into the beer part the beer making part what are some of the tricks of the trades? And don't give all your secrets up now. But what are some of the tricks of the trades of how you, you know, how you brew beer? Well, um, I don't know how many tricks there are, but I think uh, <laughs> making beer is, is, it's like many things. It's an art. Uh, you decide as the artist what you're going to paint on the canvas, what you're going to put into the kettle. Um, there is a lot of creativity in making beer. I mean, historically in this country, there hadn't been a lot of creativity. Um, just, just standard lagers and ales, no like spices or, you know, in any special combination of hops. It was just sort of pretty straightforward. But with it being craft beer, with it being, you know, more of an artisan approach where you can really look at the things that you love, you know, what spices do you like? What flavors do you like? So when you look at craft beer today, if you're someone who loves orange, you know, those are different things you can do with the beer, orange pill, uh, various types of hops that have high citrus flavor profiles. Um, if you like um, other spices like nutmeg or coriander or cumin, um, vanilla, whatever those are, you can actually, as an artist, as a chef sort of, add those spices and flavors that you love to your beers to create something memorable and exciting. So um, right now I'm working on a, a stout. Um, lots of people make lots of stouts. There's tons of IPAs or tons of every style of beer you can imagine. So it's very hard to make anything that somebody else hasn't made. You might add a little bit more of this or that. Uh, to your to your beers, uh, combination of grains or a combination of spices to, to make it stand out or give it that taste. 